good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for today's uh, topic on reserves to save or not to save. Um, we have an excellent person here with us, Will, Will with Association Reserves. Um, I don't think we could have gotten a better expert to give us an idea of what we should be doing with our reserves. So much has occurred in this past year between COVID, um, the tragedy that occurred at Champlain, and there's so many questions that are going on with, you know, inflation going up, cost of living going up. Uh, you know, what should you be doing as an association when it comes to your reserves? So in today's webinar, we're going to touch up on some questions. Uh, we do have a Q&A available for you. We'll do our best, either Will or myself, to answer your questions. If not live, we'll type in an answer. Um, so please feel free to use that Q&A. You'll find it either at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen if you scroll over and you'll see Q&A. Feel free to put in any information there as well. Uh, we have been asked several times if the video is being recorded and if you could share it with either fellow managers or with fellow board members, we are recording it. We will provide you with a link via email. It would be posted on our YouTube page and I believe also Association Reserves or Will will do their part in sharing the link as well. So without further ado, uh, Will, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction of you, um, what you do and at the firm, and uh, a little bit about the company as well. Yeah, well, thanks, Rafael. And, and before I do that, I just want to say thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you guys out there who have, who have tuned in to, to join us. Hopefully, it's going to be a great conversation. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Will Simons. I'm the president of the Florida Office for Association Reserves. We are the oldest and largest reserve study provider in the country. Uh, at this point, we have 11 offices throughout the US. Um, I manage our Florida office, which covers the entire state as well as some of the surrounding states. Um, I've been with the company for, I guess, about 13 years now. I'm a credentialed reserve specialist, as are many other folks within our industry or within our uh, organization, organization, I should say. Um, one thing I always point out is that all we do is reserve studies, right? So we are not a an accounting firm. We are not a um, engineering firm. We're we're a specialized consulting company that does this one thing, and and we've done at this point over sixty thousand reserve studies going back to the mid nineteen eighties. So. Uh, we've got a you know, very high level of um, experience and expertise and have worked with many, many communities of all different types, condos, HOAs, timeshares, resort properties, you name it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today and uh, hopefully we'll get, get some good information across and answer those questions you have. Thank you, Will. As for myself, my name is Rafael Aquino, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Affinity Management Services. We are a community association management company uh, we service uh, Dade, Broward, and also Palm Beach County. Uh, we're more of that boutique uh, management company. We work with associations that are really looking to have that personal touch where maybe they've been tired of the big, bigger organizations and looking for someone with maybe a little bit uh, more personal touch. Um, we service all tri-counties. Uh, we enjoy providing knowledge, not just to our managers, but also to our board members. So as Will said, I want to thank you as well for taking the time out of your busy day to get some additional information and knowledge that you could hopefully share with your residents or share with your fellow board members. Uh, but enough about us, why don't we get into the topic and get to business? So I, I have the million dollar question, Will, you know, that we get all the time. Should associations make uh, co continuous reserve contributions and, and why do you think they should do that? Yeah, simple answer, absolutely they should. Um, reserve contributions are really the only way to allocate the cost of living in an association uh, evenly and fairly over a period of time. Um, it, it's not supposed to be a game of musical chairs, right? Where you are, you know, two years away from your roof needing to be replaced. And now uh, the owners that live there in the building today and over the next two years are going to be uh, expected to, to raise the complete cost of replacing that roof in a short amount of time, ignoring the fact that over the last 20 years, many people have come and gone who have lived in the community. They got the use and benefit out of that roof and the elevators and everything else that the property has. Um, and if, if they're not you know, budgeting accordingly each year and, and showing everybody the true cost of ownership, meaning the reinvestment in the components and the infrastructure of the property, um, then it, it all falls to one point in time and it, it requires a special assessment or a loan, which uh, can be very, very toxic. I'm sure you guys see that from a management perspective yeah. as something that should be avoided. So yes, there, there's really never ever a circumstance where it's a good idea to uh, ignore reserve contributions. 
Yeah, excellent point. I mean, I know from a management uh, perspective, it, it, our lives is, uh, is much easier when we have associations that have properly funded reserves. Associations that don't, it becomes, you know, a strong, a, a challenge to be able to deal with them. And the reason being is, you know, you have so many projects and so many things that need to be repaired. And sometimes they just get missed many times because board members just didn't know any better, or sometimes because they didn't want to listen to what the recommendations are. Right. And like we were talking earlier, Will, right before we got on, you know, it amazes me how Florida is one of those states that, that um, allow residents to not, um, to waive reserves. And, and I think you were telling me earlier on that, that from your, from the 11 states you deal with, is, is it correct that Florida is the only one that allows the waiving of reserves? Uh, to our knowledge, yeah. And, and actually, we work in all 50 states. We have 11 offices, oh, wow. but we cover the whole country and have for quite a long time. Um, and, you know, lately, we've been trying to just compare and contrast what we see in other markets. And yeah, to our knowledge, uh, Florida is the is the only state where owners have this, this, this control or this power to waive reserve funding entirely. Um, which again is just, you know, if we could turn back time and, and wave a magic wand over the statutes, you know, all those years ago, that would be the one thing I would immediately remove. Yeah. You know, there's just never a circumstance where that is a, a good idea because it's just kicking the can down the road and creating a bigger problem that eventually you'll have to deal with later on. Correct. I would agree. And, and you know, the question that we get many times, especially now that we're in the midst of a, a budget season, you know, how much should an association reserve? And, and one of the questions that we get asked all the time from board members that just don't know, is there a minimum amount that, re that should be put into reserves by law? They believe that, you know, some I've heard people say 8%, 10%. Uh, if you can give our listeners an idea of, of, of how that works. Yeah, so in Florida, there's no specific dollar amount or percentage that they use because all associations are different, right? You, you can't use the same approach for a little 10 unit, you know, apartment style condo as you would for a, you know, 55 story luxury high rise. Um, what the board of directors is obligated to do each year is to present a budget that shows what it would take to fully fund the reserves in that upcoming fiscal year. That's really, I guess, from a legal standpoint, the only requirement is that the they show the owners, hey, folks, this is what it would take based on our listing of components, based on the life expectancies and costs we have for these things, and the amount of cash that we have on hand now, this is what we should be doing. The owners can then vote to, um, or I should say, you know, the, that that's the default setting. If the yeah. owners want to uh, do less than that to underfund the reserves or to waive the reserves entirely, then it has to go to a membership vote. Um, but yeah, there isn't any specific dollar amount. The 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 ten percent of the budget rule gets kind of tossed around from time to time. Um, I think that's ultimately coming from the um, from the FHA. FHA, right? yeah, correct. So when you have particular types of mortgages where people can buy into a community with very low down payment with an FHA backed mortgage, uh, one of the underwriting criteria that the FHA wants to see for that particular association among several others is that at a minimum 10% of their budget is going to reserves. So that's kind of emerged as this rule of thumb that some people abide by, but um, in our experience, that's actually not anywhere near enough most of the time. It should usually be a much higher uh, number than that. Of course, with so much going on and, and also an important tip for those managers and board members that maybe aren't aware, uh, you don't necessarily you don't have to present to the residents a budget without reserves. You do have the right to just present a budget uh, with fully funded reserves and just do your vote as needed. I know I get the question many times. Well, if it's over 15 percent, we're going to need a vote. You need to review your documents, but I think there's only been one set of documents in my 15 years of doing this that I've seen where it has a restriction on how much you can increase the fees. So if it's a decision of, for you and your board that you believe that's your fiduciary responsibility and that's what needs to be done in your community, then that's the option that you have. I'll tell you this much. You may get some kicking and screaming once you send the notices out and once the, the, the actual meeting occurs. After that, residents most of the times get amnesia and they move on um, because they understand that you're doing what's right, especially if it's communicated properly uh, to the residents. Right. So with regards to, to reserves, Will, um, you know, we get the people get confused as what you can and what you can't um, put into reserves. So for instance, sometimes people ask, can we put insurance payments, or I should say deductibles, landscaping, 40-year recertification? 
maybe if you could give, I know you can't give every component because you'll be here yeah. all day, <laughs> kind of <laughs> sure. like a high level of, of what you include uh, within these reserve studies. Sure, sure. So the, yeah, and I'll make a distinction between what you can reserve for and maybe what you should reserve for. Okay, so okay. Um, Florida statutes, particularly statute 718 for condos, uh, specifies three things in particular that you should be reserving for. And then they have a, a general sort of definition that goes along with that too. So the three things that all condos need to include are roof, excuse me, roof replacement, painting the building and pavement resurfacing. In addition to that, they also say, and for any other item with a replacement cost exceeding $10,000. Um, now we can kind of put a pin in that for a second because that $10,000 number is often something that, that we uh, uh, think is a, a threshold that's too high. Um, from our standpoint, from a professional reserve study standpoint, when we come into a property, we actually use a, a slightly different criteria that is, I think, broader and more comprehensive than what's uh, put out there in the statute. So we look for things that meet a certain four part criteria. The four parts being that the component has to be the association's responsibility. It has to have a limited useful life. It has to have a predictable remaining useful life. And the keyword there is predictable. I'll circle back to that in a second. And then the last uh, part is that it has to have a significant cost, a significant threshold cost. So it doesn't specify a dollar amount because again, not all associations are the same size. Right. So when I come out to a property, when we come out to a property, we're looking for things that meet those four criteria. Obviously roofing, painting and pavement all meet those, those criteria. Um, but there's usually dozens of things um, on any given property that might meet those, that definition. So, um, so that's kind of what you should be reserving for. Um, legally speaking, a board can create reserve funds for other things. Um, I'll give the classic example is insurance deductibles, yeah. right? So people or, or communities will see this as this potentially very, very large expense they may have to pay one day. And they say, hey, can we start a reserve for this? And the reason why I would say that it's not a great idea to put put together a reserve for that is because in order to calculate the amount of funding going towards that line item, you have to have a predictable timeline, right? You know, if we're talking about a roof or an air conditioner or a swimming pool, those all have predictable cyclical recurring life expectancies. Payment of an insurance deductible will come as a surprise, right? That's why we have insurance in the first place. You don't know when a hurricane or a fire or a flood is going to happen. So there's no predictable way to determine when the expense takes place and therefore how much money you should be contributing towards it. So what we tell our clients is that you should have your operating budget for your operating expenses, right? The routine daily, weekly, monthly types of costs. You have your reserve funds for the things that meet the criteria that we're talking about now. And then it's a great idea to establish an emergency fund or maybe an emergency line of credit uh, that will pay for the unforeseen stuff, the things that, that will come as a surprise. You know, um, there are certain components like plumbing, like underground utility lines um, that when a community is early in its lifespan, you know, maybe don't need to be in the reserve schedule, but as problems start to emerge over a few decades and you start to spend more and more money on repairs or replacements, maybe at that point it's, it's time to reevaluate and say, okay, should we establish a, a reserve fund for this thing? Because now it's, it's become more of a predictable recurring issue. So there is no one you know, perfect approach to take. Each community mm -hmm. is different, but that's kind of the thought process we go through. Correct. And I've seen it similar to, I mean, we've, we've worked together with several associations and I see how detailed um, your organization is in, in really outlining each piece of equipment. Because as you stated, you, you guys have outlined things that are maybe a lesser of value but it's important to have front of mind, like let's say like a sprinkler pump or, or, or components yeah. that are, have to deal with the sprinkler. Because yeah. number one, it gives the manager and the board an awareness of what you need to have moving forward, especially for those associations that are partially funded. You're yeah. going to need to have that expense. It's coming one day or another. You know, yes. if it's a year before or two years before, maybe a year or two years after, it's going to happen. So, right. so that's the benefit of really having um, a, a good reserve study by a good organization. It makes management and the board's life uh, much easier. Yeah. Now, let's say a, a board decided to get this reserve study and, and you've broken down all the components, all the costs, and, and how the schedule needs to break down. Uh, how often should they be renewing this reserve study? Um, and how long is it normally good for? 
Yeah, so um, a reserve study has an expiration date. You know, at the on the cover page of all of our studies, we will show, okay, here's the start date, which is the start of the next upcoming fiscal year. And that set of data, those recommendations expire at the end of that fiscal year because they're all based on what we know at a certain point in time. You know, right now, here we are in October, 2021. I know what the current market prices are for roofing and painting and elevators and all the stuff that we're looking at in the reserve study as of now. Next year, you know, who knows if at the rate certain things are inflating and, and the market conditions are dictating out there, those cost estimates that we're using today may be way off by, you know, even next spring or next year. Um, so a reserve study is not a once in a lifetime thing. It does need to be done periodically. Um, you know, I guess one way to answer that question is that every single year, the board has to present a new budget and a new reserve schedule. And so there are quite a few associations that want to do annual updates to that reserve study. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to hire somebody to do it. Um, but at the very least, they should be going through all the data points, you know, reducing life expectancies to account for the year that's gone by, you know, maybe calling vendors to see how prices might have changed. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, Legally speaking, they, they're not obligated to do reserve studies in Florida at any specific interval at this point in time that, that may point. change within the next year. Yeah. Um, you know, what we see in other markets we work in is that reserve studies are legally required in some mm -hmm. states and typically it's every three years. So yeah. if you wanted to use that as a rule of thumb, you know, at least every third year, your, your association should be having a, a formal update done. Uh, to kind of, you know, see if, if your form, if your uh, previous assumptions are still holding up to account for any work that you've done, right? You need to reset life expectancies for work that's, that's been completed um, and then kind of course correct and go forward from there. Correct. And I know from my experience in working with you guys that, that for, for those board members that haven't done a reserve study, the cost isn't the same when you're re redoing the reserve study. There is slightly right. different of a cost because they've already have the components um, I have a question here from Celestine, which is a pretty good question, is how do you determine the cost of, of the different reserve items? Sure. Well, that's based on, uh, you know, market pricing, ultimately. So when we're looking at um, any given community, uh, we, you know, in the course of any one year, we deal with hundreds, if not thousands of properties, and we're tracking data points on every job that we do. So if I look at what a particular community has paid to seal coat their asphalt, for example, okay, we can say, all right, here's what they paid, you know, $1.20 per square yard. And maybe we'll compare that against another 15 or 20 communities that have done the same type of project. And we now we have a range of data that's all based on real world market pricing. Um, so we'll do that sort of approach where we want to try to, you know, uh, you know, uh, base all of our figures off of the actual market conditions at that point in time. Uh, we also supplement that by talking to vendors, right? So we'll talk to asphalt companies or elevator companies, swimming pool companies, uh, and find out, okay, you know, what is this appropriate scope of work that needs to be done? And what's the price point here? So uh, for any given community, we try to source as much of the cost information in that reserve study from their own history. So if they have just, you know, uh, done a tennis court project two years ago, and we know what they paid for that, we're going to probably base the next life cycle for that project in large part off what they already paid. So at the end of the day, it, it, there, you know, there's no crystal ball. These are all estimates, but they come from real world uh, pricing that we've seen either at that community or at some other ones. Excellent. Uh, Will, I have a couple uh, people have asked twice or three times. Um, what, if you could repeat the four criteria points um, that are required for the condos. Sure. Yeah. So association has to be responsible. And I'll, and I'll maybe give some examples as we go. So most of the time, windows and doors in a building are determined to be that owner's responsibility, not the association. So that would be excluded on that count. Um, limited useful life is number two. So that means if something is meant to last the life of the community, right? If it's a concrete block wall that should be there for decades or, you know, the foundation of a building that you would never proactively need to replace, you're not reserving for those things. They're just meant to be there indefinitely. Um, predictable remaining useful life is the third. Uh, and again, that's, you know, how often will this work take place and what is the scope of work going to be? If you can't reasonably predict that, then it's very difficult to base any accurate calculations off of that timeline. And then the last part is the cost. You know, it has to be above a significant threshold cost to that community. So again, in a smaller association, that might be $1,500. You know, if yeah. you've got 
eight units in your building, 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks, you know, split on only eight ways, that's still significant. So, uh, you know, the $10,000 number that comes from statute is a good starting point, but I would say, look at your own individual budget. And um, even if you've got a lot of small things, collectively, they can add up to be one large amount. And the advantage of putting those in reserves is you're taking the pressure off of the operating budget, which would otherwise be the only way to, uh, to deal with those costs. Of course. And, and I have a question here from Joanne. Basically, she's asking, how about for HOAs? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I know we've done several HOAs. I know it's still a very robust report, but maybe if you can give them an, some insight on the HOA part of it as well. Yeah, sure. It's real easy. It's the exact same approach. The, the only difference with HOAs is that Florida statutes don't have a specific checklist. So the condo statute specifies roofing, painting, pavement, and anything over 10 grand. HOAs have no such criteria. So we just fall back on what are called National Reserve Study Standards, which uses that four-part test. So you know we're not talking about individual homes. We're looking at roads and gate entrances and swimming pools and tennis courts, you know, irrigation systems, all the stuff that an HOA is responsible for Mm -hmm. that meets that four criteria. So that's kind of the beauty of that test is that you can apply it to any different type of property anywhere in the country and result with a, um, a pretty comprehensive list of what they should have in their reserves. Correct. And just if you're an HOA, don't take it lightly because, um, depending, especially with the roadways and the clubhouse, uh, we just, we have an association that had the proper reserves, but they had to do all their roadways. They didn't have a community development district that was in charge of it. And the roadway uh, project was almost $600,000. I mean, it was only 300 units, but they had a lot of roads. Sure. Um, so it's important that even if you're an HOA, I know many times we speak in terms of condos, but in reality, uh, HOAs is just as important because you can have many components that you're not um, well aware of. Uh, Cindy asked a question here. She asked, I guess it was the comment that I made, which is where does it legally state that we don't have to present it? So obviously I'm not an attorney, but either way, what the statute says is that you could provide that option. The statute does not say that you have to give them the option to vote it down. So yeah, um, and in in fact, just to add on to that, I've I've actually, I think I read somewhere that in some cases, the membership would have to petition the board for an alternate budget. So, so board members out there, you are not obligated to come out with a plan A and a plan B, right? You just say, okay, this is what it takes to fully fund the reserves. And if the owners, you know, want to do less than that, it's actually incumbent on them to request it. It's my understanding. Correct. And, And in my experience, I've experienced it where a board has gone to fully fund it and it was an impact. Um, and no one I've never had in my 15 years, someone come back because it does take, I believe it's 10% of the membership to, to, uh, to request, and they have to propose mm-hmm. a budget and the board can still, uh, uh say, we're not going to approve that budget. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a situation where it's a win-win for the board. Right. If again, they want to make that decision, if they feel it's the best for the community. So, so Will, I do want to ask, I mean, uh, I don't know if you have any tricks or, or, or <laughs> what you've done or what you've said to convince board members. So I know we go into the situation where maybe one board member is very gun ho They've seen what's happened. You know, they're coming into the community. They're like, listen, we need to do what's right for our investment. For many people, and for many people, this is really their, their number one investment. So is there anything that you tell board members to be able to convince them? Um, or how do you guide them into making that decision that the reserve study is important? Sure. Um, I would just zoom out a little bit and say, are you going to do your own legal defense? Are you going to do your own insurance appraisals? Are you going to prepare your own financial audits and, and put a stamp on that, that you're, you know, a CPA? No, um, you know, a reserve study is a professional service um, that, you know, every association should be considering as uh, very valuable. I mean, it's not impossible for a board to develop their own reserve schedule. Um, but what we find most of the time when like, we'll go into a community that's done their own reserve budgeting for a number of years and they'll say, okay, this is what we've been using. Sometimes it's not bad, sometimes it's horrible. And it's not the fault of uh, you know, bad intentions on the part of the board that was using it. Most often they just don't know what they don't know, right? They're, they're uh, unaware of the fact that a uh, in, you know, irrigation pump station maybe only lasts 15 to 20 years. Yeah and costs, you know, can cost $100,000 to replace. All they know is that the sprinklers go on and the grass is green, right? Yeah. So, but you have to understand all the moving parts to a community and, and determine what goes into the true cost of ownership of making those things, um, you know, part of the budget. So I think that's the, exper- the, the, um, 
the value that we bring to the table is, is you know, just having the knowledge to know what belongs there in the first place. And also, um, I think there's value in the fact that we're an independent third party. You know, I get the feedback from a lot of boards that um, they'll tell us, okay, we, you know, we've been trying to push reserves for a long time, but people just didn't believe us. They thought we were just trying to raise the dues on them and that, you know, we were going to run off with this, you know, piggy bank full of money. <laughs> no, it's, that's, that's, you know, totally ridiculous. Um, but if they hear it from a third party, somebody who's experienced, who's credentialed, um, then sometimes that gets more buy-in from the community, I would say. Correct. And I would agree with you uh, wholeheartedly on that because I know we, we try to use that tool as much as possible. I mean, the expense associated with a reserve study is so minimal compared to what any other expense that you have to deal with within your community. Um, even if it's just knowing that something's going to break uh, in a few years, it's, it's good to know earlier on. Um, and it's an amazing tool to be able to, as you stated, to convince the residents <clears throat> and the membership, which technically they don't have to, but you do want to communicate if you're on the board and be transparent, saying, listen, if here's what the reserve study is telling us. These are estimates. Do keep in mind that they're estimates. They're not right. solid numbers. Uh, we're going to need to spend a million dollars in the next five years. Where are we going to get this money from? And it doesn't end after the five years, right? You still have uh, the yeah. continuing the next five years that you have to go through. So that's why you're finding many associations that are in their 60 years, 50 years, 40 years, where they're having to take out a loan. They get a big project done, let's say a restoration or their four-year recertification. And then here comes the elevator that needs to be done because it's around, it's now 38, 39 years. They stretched it. Right. They now have to get another loan, fold everything back in, and it becomes very complicated. And before you know it, you're paying double, triple right. what your regular maintenance fees were, were. But if you would have done that in the right way from the beginning, right. it would have been a totally different story. Yeah, it's, it's a long-term vision, right? Yeah. I think that's a that's something that a lot of boards suffer from is this kind of short-term mentality. Okay, what's on tap for next year, the next three years, yeah. next five years? And they're ignoring the fact that, hey, 20 years from now, this is going to be the biggest thing you'll ever pay for. But if you start saving up for it today, it's going to be a lot easier, right? So sometimes I use the analogy of like saving for uh, a kid's college fund. Right. If you start it when they're first born, by the time your, your kids 18, 19 going off to college, you'll have a much better chance of having put the money away. If you start right. on their 10th birthday or their 12th birthday, you're condensing the amount of money you have to save into a much, much tighter window of time. And the chances that that's going to be more of a financial burden go up. So, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a brand new community or not. Start funding for these things. Think long term and spread the cost over the longest period of time that you can. Excellent. And a great analogy there. So I know we get this a lot. I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, I do see that Cindy has, has an example of it here up on, as one of the questions, which is they get the challenge where a board member will say, well, I don't plan on living here for that long. Or I've heard also in my 55 and older communities, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, I'm not going to be around for yeah. those expenses. What do you what do you say in those kinds of situations? Well, first of all, from the board's perspective, that is completely irresponsible uh, to think that way, right? So the, the board has a legal fiduciary duty to represent the best interests of the corporation, okay? Not for profit corporation, but it's still a corporation and in Florida, they're subject to statute 617. So they have the same fiduciary duty as the directors at, um, you know, Bank of America or Microsoft. They have an, they have a, an asset, which in this case is a, is a community, um, and they have to promote and protect and preserve the interests of that corporation, uh, which is not the same as trying to be nice to, you know, Mrs. Miller down the street who's living on a fixed income and, and really doesn't want the dues to go up. That's not the goal of the board. Um, so, so first and foremost, by joining the board, by volunteering for that duty, you are taking on that responsibility and it is not to try to make it easy for the owners. Um, Second of all, this comes down to an issue of, um, I guess, of fairness, of, of equitability. You want um, to pay for things proportionally over the lifespan of their assets. So whether or not you're living in the community at the time the project X, Y, and Z take place, you will have enjoyed some of the lifespan of that asset, right? And so you, it's, it's better to think of reserve funding as offsetting the current level of deterioration that takes place in any one fiscal year. Correct. Yes, the byproduct of doing that is you accumulate funds and you build up an account so that when something does need to be replaced, you've saved up for it. But it's not, it's not appropriate to just 
shift the burden to the time of replacement and just again like i said earlier play this game of musical chairs where there's some unlucky group of people who happen to live there when you know in your example when the roads get repaved and they pick up the tab for everybody that came before them right it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way it's not fair and and there's changes that that are needed because it impacts everything it impacts the operation of of the of the building it impacts the, the manager because they're having to, to disseminate why these challenges are occurring, why these costs uh, have gone up. And I believe with what with everything that has occurred recently, um, you're, you're starting to see savvier investors. Uh, I know we yeah. got in from a management side where they're requesting financials, which before it was unheard of. Yes, it was common with certain realtors and brokers. Mm-hmm. But now you're, you're we're receiving a much higher request of, can I get a copy of the financials? I want to see how well funded they are. Do yeah. they have the capital reserves? Do they have, do they have sorry, do they have the, the reserves necessary? So if you're looking to sell your property or eventually maybe give it to a family member that will inherit the property, I don't think it would be a great idea to have them inherit something that all of a sudden needs a 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollar assessment right. if it's a large community. So, you know, taking those proactive steps now is not only going to be good for you, it'll be good for whoever you end up selling it to or whoever ends up taking over that asset on your behalf. Correct. Yeah, it, it all comes down to property value. So, you know, and associations that are doing this correctly and are funding their reserves the way they should, should use that as a selling point. Because 100%. if I'm a potential buyer and I'm looking at two different condos or two different HOAs, one has reserves and one doesn't. Um, all else being equal, the community that has the reserves should be more attractive to me because I'm going to be less exposed to special assessments to loans. There's a better chance that the community is in better physical condition. The curb appeal is better. The amenities are up to date. They have more modern technology. That's where I want to live. I'm willing to pay a premium to live in that community. Um, and so the flip side is true as well. If I'm a potential buyer and I, and I start asking questions, there's a history of special assessments. Okay, the balance sheet shows there's next to nothing in reserves. The, the people that are paying attention will realize, okay, this is, this is not as good of a financial investment for me, despite the fact that I may love the unit, the views are great, okay, you know, I'm going to be close to my friends and family. You know, <laughs> South Florida is a very competitive real estate market. There's a ton of associations out there, and the ones that can distinguish themselves as the better places to live uh, I think should be the ones that have a healthy reserve fund that are running their corporation in a financially responsible way. Correct. Correct. And you're even seeing that even insurance companies now kind of requesting the yeah. information as well. Banks, so mortgage yep. lenders, insurance companies, the, the big players in the real estate industry um, have become more and more interested in reserves over the years. But especially now, you know, after what happened this year with Champlain Towers, um, you can absolutely be sure that buying a condo, even buying a home in an HOA is not going to be the same. There's going to be a no. lot more underwriting, a lot more questions asked, and um, the ones, the, the communities that are doing this in the proper way, hopefully will stand out. Correct. So for, let's say a community that has been severely underfunded for many years, so let's say 40 year recertification, or in some cases, 50, 60, uh, do you suggest any additional assessments to make up for that lost time um, for the, once the projects are coming due? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what a special assessment is 99% of the time. It's a catch-up contribution that is, you know, bringing the association up to date for many prior years when the budget was not sufficient, right? It should not come as a surprise if you've been underfunding reserves or waiving them for a long period of time. Now you're up against the deadline where some work needs to get done. Well, it's, it's perfectly fair and appropriate to point out to those owners who are going to have to pay that assessment, hey, some of you have lived here for a number of years and you have enjoyed budgets that were less than they should have been. Whether or not people you know, wanted it that way or not, um, that's the reality of the situation. So you know, a special assessment at that point is the inevitable result of not paying in advance. You, know, you pay all at once and it's, you know, like I said, a, a catch-up contribution making up for lost time. So un- unfortunate and, and uh, difficult when those things happen, but is the only logical conclusion. Correct. And, and it's just going to get more difficult because I know what we've seen, <clears throat> especially with, with what's going to go on. I mean, legislation, well, we won't know everything that's going to come out until July, June, July. Um, but there's definitely going to be some changes. Um, based on what the conversations I've had, again, this is just my opinion. Um, I do believe that there's going to be certain requirements within reserves. Uh, hopefully that at least we'll get to a bare minimum of requiring at least partially funded reserves. So at least we could get started. Yep. I know the challenge for many communities. Okay, well, how do we do catch up? 
So I, I know I've made recommendations, you know, HOAs and most HOA documents that we've seen, if you're an HOA board member or an HOA manager, make sure you read your documents. In many of the documents for HOAs, you could find something called a capital contribution. Mm -hmm. And the board has the right to decide, okay, we're going to do three months, six months, one year. It's your decision as a board in most documents. We've been using that tool to allow our, our associations to either fund the reserves if, for those that don't have or use that as an additional income source. I made the recommendation to legislation saying, hey, how about if we, we can allow something similar to condos so that we can allow a catch-up period so anyone that's mm -hmm. purchasing new maybe pays in six months, 12 months, whatever it may be, to help catch up the association on the reserves. So yep. there's many different techniques. Again, you could do a special assessment to catch it up over X amount of years and using those funds. But ultimately, the associations are going to continue to get old. This is not going to go anywhere for some time because if it goes too far, there's always the, pull, the pullback a little bit. But there's going to be things that as board members and managers, you need to have a, a top of mind of how you're going to deal with the situation. And more importantly, making sure that you're advising your clients of these upcoming challenges that, that they're going to be dealing with. And, and yep. what is the recommended percentage of, again, I got this question here. What's the recommended percentage of the total budget uh, needed to put towards reserves, which I don't think there's. Take well, we have, we have some insight to that. So um, the way that we try to answer that question is by looking at the, the uh, you know, an analysis of the communities that we've worked with. And we say, okay, let's, let's look at the communities that are doing well, right? The ones that have a healthy reserve fund, on average, how much of their budget is going into reserves. And so we've done internal studies with as many as like 10,000 properties. And we look at, okay, on average, what is that percentage of the budget? And what we found is that it's typically between 15, 1.5 and 40% of the budget, right? So, um, point is this is not an afterthought you know reserves are not uh what's whatever's left in the operating uh, account at the end of the year we'll we'll move the excess into reserves and call it a day now this should be if not the single biggest line item in the annual budget certainly in the top two or three for any association um you know you can drill down a little bit farther from that i would say on average condos probably need to be contributing more than hoas because there's more things that they're responsible for yep older properties need to contribute more than newer properties because they're probably closer to the end date of some of their component life expectancies, particularly if they haven't funded over the years. Um, coastal properties probably have to contribute a little bit more, you know, properties that have a lot of amenities, you know, you, you can kind of narrow that down. But um, yeah, the, the point is, it, it's not an afterthought, it should be a, a pretty sizable number. So if your community out there, you know, is only contributing 3%, 5%, 8%, even 10% of the budget, most of the time, that's not nearly enough, particularly if a lot of time has gone by, and you've just been doing that kind of bare minimum amount over the years. Correct. Excellent point. Um, I do want to provide a clarification because Michael asked here is a capital contribution outside definition of, of the reserve. So again, I'm, I'm just using that term as a catch up. I'm not using it as you should still have your reserve study because again, it could be argued that a capital contribution, you don't know when that income is going to come in as Will was saying a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. It's if you're able to gain that excess account, let's say you're moving that into your operating as part of your income, you're moving that income in 80 at the end of the year to help catch up not necessarily use it towards your operating or use it as, oh, well, my, cop my capital contribution is my reserve contribution. So I do want to provide that clarification um, because you don't know when the units are going to sell. Right now, the market is insane. I'm sure most of you would agree with me. There's a lot of estoppels, a lot of transitions uh, going on. However, when the market takes the shift, which it will, um, you're not going to be able to, to be able to fund your reserves properly. Again, it was just a mechanism to be able to help you catch up for those that don't have it. Um, well, can you clarify here? I know we, we get the question of, of you know, the, the differences between operating and reserve. Um, does it impact owners if we pay reserve expenses uh, from the operating? In a sense, not really, because it's all coming from the same pocketbooks, mm -hmm. right? So people write one check to the association typically each month, and a portion of that money goes to reserves, a portion goes to the operating expenses. Um, if you're paying for reserve components, out of your operating budget, okay, good that you're paying for them, 
but are you now taking money away from your operating budget, right? Are you are you running at a shoestring budget to the point that you can't absorb, you know, higher than expected insurance bills or uh, utilities costs or, you know, the need to hire a new maintenance person for your association, right? So to me, there should be a pretty clear delineation between operating expenses and reserve expenses. Operating money is the routine daily, weekly costs of just managing the association, you know, payroll, utilities, preventive maintenance, maintenance, legal fees, all that kind of stuff, reserve components, um, you know, roofing, painting, pavement, air conditioning, elevators, all the physical infrastructure type things we're talking about. And, and there shouldn't really be a, a mixing of the two. Um, it is possible to pay for reserve components out of operating. Say if you've got a contingency fund and you and your reserves are a bit short, yeah, you can do that. Cannot go the other way, by the way, unless you get the owners to approve it. You can't use reserve money for operating expenses. Um, but it, it's much better to have a clear understanding of which is which. Correct. <clears throat> and again, a budget is a budget. There, there should be some cushion. I like the way you said there, the shoestring. There definitely should be some cushion in each line item because mm -hmm. things do happen, um, especially in an association that happen every single day. So right. um, well, why reserves instead of a special assessment for each project? That, you know, that's a common question. Sure. So um, I think part of it is a psychological or, or your perspective issue. I think special assessments are toxic. Um, they're they're bad for morale. Uh, they're they're bad for boards. They're bad for management companies. You know, boards get thrown out on their heels when there's special assessment. Management companies get fired when there's special assessments. It's not a good thing for an association. Usually a special assessment is an emergency situation, right? Something you could have never seen coming happened and now you've got to pay for it. That's, that's when a special assessment is the appropriate thing to do. Not for routine, predictable, recurring projects like the things we've been talking about today. Um, because of that, that issue of, you know, I, I guess of fairness, but it's not just a matter of pulling on people's heartstrings here it's a business decision, right? You pay as you go, you fund things proportionally so that everybody pays their fair share of the cost of these components over their lifespan, not all at once, you know, when the music stops. And the reason why people should care about that is again, by viewing it from the lens of a potential buyer and recognizing that there's value in having a healthy reserve fund so that new incoming people into the community are not gonna have to pay more than their fair share because if they recognize that and they do, um, that's going to impact property values in the community. So yeah, special assessments are for emergencies, not for routine, uh, predictable projects. Yeah, I know <clears throat> you nailed it on the head when you said managing companies get fired when they're special. <laughs> and that does happen. Yeah. Um, no one likes it to admit it's, it, but it's, it's not it's good. a challenge. It's yeah. a challenge to deal with uh, as well, just because you're having owners that need to send separate payments because you have separate bank accounts for that. It's not that it's not possible. We do it all right. the time. Um, but unfortunately, it does become very difficult and it's difficult for the board members as well. And, and again, my experience has shown is that when we walk into a property that has a special assessment, we have one right now that has two mm -hmm. and they're now needing to potentially walk into a third. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's going to continue to be this way and the building's yeah. only 39 years old. Um, so, you know, so we it, have it becomes like a scarlet letter at some Correct. point too, right? Yeah. I mean, right. like if you're, if let's say in your scenario, then, um, you know, they have one, two special assessments under their belt, and now they've discovered, okay, we have another thing we need to pay for. Now, let's say they wanted to go out to a bank and try to get a loan for that project, that third project. The bank is going to ask them, okay, do you have a history of special assessments here? Correct. And if that's the case, then they're going to view that negatively. That is yeah. that is not a good thing to have on your track record. It's like, as an individual, you don't want to have a bankruptcy in your own personal history, right? They, they see that that is a sign of financial mismanagement. Special assessments are the same way, right? You ran up against something, you didn't, you didn't have a plan in advance. That is not how lenders, how other third parties want to do business, right? So, um, no, you're you're completely right. Thing. And in this in this particular association um, that we just took on, maybe about a year, two years ago, they have, you know, the, the banks also have formulas that they use to be able to determine based on value how much is the maximum that they're willing to lend you. So it becomes very difficult because you have a special assessment, which you can roll essentially into a loan as well, but they're only going to lend you X amount of dollars. So right. again, it, it, it becomes very challenging um, for boards and managers. And I believe, as we've stated multiple times, that now buyers, realtors are going to become a little bit more savvy and it's going to be very difficult for, for those properties to, to manage that situation when it comes to a sale. No question.
Um, and, and what's the best way to respond to, to like a board that wants to keep like the monthly assessments low or that they believe that the money's not needed for major repairs? Um, what, what do you think that managers or board members, what approach they should take there? I think everybody needs to understand the true cost of ownership of real estate, right? If, if you have a just a, a homestead somewhere that's not part of an association, you are responsible for everything, okay? If you get a leaky roof, you're going to pay to fix it. If your mailbox gets knocked down, you're buying a new one. Uh, if you need to replace the, you know, the carpeting in your home, that's your expense. Living in a condo or in an HOA, yes, although some of those things are owned in common with everybody else, the true cost of owning in that community needs to include the expenditures for those assets because they contribute to your property value. Um, Ignoring your reserves, relying on special assessments or loans is just delaying the inevitable, right? You're, you're just shifting the burden onto particular groups of owners at, at particular points in time, rather than spreading the cost over a longer period. Um, the, the right way to look at this is not by comparing, you know, five buildings on a street and saying, okay, this one has the lowest dues on the block, so they must be the best building. Correct. Um, it doesn't work that way. That's not the right metric. Uh, you know, that's like looking at five different companies and saying, okay, well, which one has the, um, the cheapest product on the shelf and they must be the best manufacturer out there. It doesn't work that way. You're looking Correct. for value. Um, and so for communities that are, that are basing all of their financial planning off of this, this short-sighted mindset of competing against other communities and trying to keep the dues low relative to somebody else, that becomes a race to the bottom. Right. Um, the, the correct way to look at this is the, the entire financial picture of this association. Do they have healthy reserves? Do they have good insurance? Do they have good legal protection? Are they reinvesting in their community? Are they trying to compete with the latest and greatest communities that are being developed and built all the time? Um, that is the right way to think of this, not just, you know, their dues are 300 bucks and ours are 400 bucks. So we need to bring it down because we're not going to compete with them. That's, that's a very short sighted way to look at it. And I would agree 100%. So I have a great question here um, from Fred and Fred asked, um, what do we do with assets that we can't project remaining useful life? An example that he gives is they have a 20 year uh, elevator that's been partially funded and it's exceeded the original life, but it continues to work. He states Florida statute calls for fully funding as original life has been passed. Well, that's a great question. So um, if it's on paper exceeded its useful life, then you could argue that you should be financially prepared to do this project as early as possible because the chances are that it's going to need to be done very soon are, are pretty high. I'll use this analogy all the time where I say, okay, if let's say I drive an old pickup truck and it's got 250,000 miles on it. By one argument, you could say, as long as my truck starts up each day and I can drive to work and back, I don't need to go out and buy a new one. But if I'm thinking ahead, right, I should have some money in the bank because one day I'm going to go out to my driveway and I'm going to turn the key and nothing's going to happen. And now I got to get a new truck. So if you're talking about an elevator, you're dealing with uh, technical obsolescence. You're dealing with the reliance on parts that may not be available anymore. So just because you go out and push the button and it goes up and down, that doesn't mean that it's not a ticking time bomb, right? That it may, may, may fail at any point and you're going to need to replace it. Now, can you fine tune that approach? Yeah, of course. Let's talk to your elevator vendor. Let's see, do they have parts available? Um, you know, do you have uh, any forecast or timeline of, you know, maybe if we do certain repairs to certain things, we can buy ourselves another three years. And if you can, yeah, then by all means, budget accordingly. You can, you can maybe be more confident than extending the life expectancy out by some number of years with good reason. But if you're just uh, flying blind and you're saying it's, you know, normally a 20 year, 25 year life and it's 30 years old. Yeah, it may still be working, but you should be financially prepared to do something about that very soon. And that's where your reserves come in. Definitely. <clears throat> and Michael asked here, I think that I can answer this. Was asked, as to the waiver, does the question need to be specifically asked and voted upon? Or can it just be listed in the budget and have homeowners vote on the total budget without a specific reference? So yes, Michael, basically, if you're asking, does the reserve, if you're going to place reserves and you've never had reserves, you're just going to mail that budget out and you're going to send a budget with the schedule that shows total, uh, total, total budget with reserves. And this is the total cost uh, to the association. The board's going to take that vote. If the board agrees with that, you move forward. Um, you move forward with that approved budget. So you don't necessarily, again, you don't have to provide 
the option to waive down or to partially fund the reserves. That is, a, that is a board decision of whether you're going to put that up for a vote, and then the members would vote uh, to waive it down. But again, you don't have to give that option. Uh, let me see here. We have another question uh, from Marilyn. Marilyn asks, is a contingency fund good to have, and what can it be used for? Uh, yeah, I'll jump on that one. So I, I would say, yes, a contingency fund is definitely a good thing to have. And, and specifically, you want to have that in the operating side of the budget, right? So you, you, it's very frowned upon to have contingencies in your reserve budget, because you want to have your reserves as, as clearly defined as possible for those predictable uh, recurring components. Contingencies are there for the unexpected and the, and the unexpected always happens. It, it should be expected, right? So, but the way you put that is on the operating side of things. Um, you can also have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a line of credit. I would say that's a great thing for an association to have, um, whether that's to be used only for emergency purposes, like an insurance deductible, or if you know FPNL raises their rates from one year to the next, your your insurance carrier jacks up their rates. That contingency can help you uh, deal with those unforeseen surprises. But to the extent you can predict things, that's where you want to do that on on the reserve side. Excellent. And I think we missed this question, which would have been a great question by Catherine. She asked, "Can you explain the difference between uh, a pooled reserve and a straight line reserve?" Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it relatively yeah. short. I actually, I, I teach a whole, uh, a whole class on the yeah. subject, which I'm happy to, to send links to. Um, but generally speaking, I'll, I'll try to break it down like this. So the old fashioned way of funding reserves is something called the straight line method or also known as the component method. And the way I explain that is you think of having different separate buckets of money that are intended for particular things, right? So you might have a roof bucket, a swimming pool bucket, elevator bucket, and you know mechanical bucket. And each year at, at budget time, you look at the contents of those accounts, of those buckets, and you're funding it according to a specific calculation, money that's meant only for that intended purpose, okay? So it's a, it's a more conservative, more restricted way of funding your reserves that ultimately in our experience end up costing the owners more money because it's not as efficient as if you were to take those buckets of money, dump them into one big bathtub. That's something that's called the pooled method where you treat all of your available reserve cash as collectively available for any reserve component. So there's no longer any distinction between roof reserves versus asphalt reserves. It is all just reserve money. It's held in one pool of funds and it's available for anything on the list. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of how that works. Um, you know, it is more complicated than that. But uh, what I can tell you is that nationally speaking, the pooled method has been the way to go for decades. Florida is still the only place I'm aware of where people still use the straight line method. Um, part of that is because prior to the year 2002, pooling was not allowed, but now it's been allowed for almost 20 years. More and more communities are making that switch and never looking back each year. Um, so again, you know, that's, uh, we don't have quite enough time today to go into more specifics than that, but I do have a whole class on the subject, which I'll be happy to, uh, to share the links for. No, and I would agree with you that <clears throat> we find that, um, the pool method is much easier to deal with because there are situations where you have, as the example with the, with the elevator, where maybe the useful life went a little bit longer and, and you're going to use, you know, you get to kind of, I don't want to say play because technically the money is all allocated yeah. for what it's so used it's for. more flexible, but it's more flexible. You don't have to take a vote from the membership to be able to use monies that are allocated for the reserves to use it for a pool restoration. That's, that's what's needed at that particular moment. So the flexibility is there and makes it a little bit easier. I know from my side that where we've experienced once or twice where they, and again, I do want to make a recommendation that if you're going to go from a straight line to a pool, you are going to need to take a vote uh, on that if you're using. So you have to you have to keep that in mind. You have to contact your attorney if you're going to make any changes in the method of how you're um, putting your reserves uh, aside. Mm -hmm. um, I said, right. but, that it, but just to point out, that's a one time yeah. vote, right? Yeah, so one, when, thank when you, you pool yes. your reserves, mm -hmm. you're done. It's not like you have to renew that vote each year. So it's you know much better than having to vote each and every single time okay. in the straight line format if you want to use you know, money that was intended for painting to pay for an elevator project, then you have to get the majority of the owners to approve that. And it becomes a logistical nightmare every time that has to happen. Correct. Um, so I have a great question here is how is your firm dealing with the with inflation um, in the pooled method? 
Sure. So inflation is real. Uh, inflation happens from one year to the next all the time. It, it varies from one year to the next. Um, when you're dealing with a pooled uh, approach in Florida, um, there is a particular restriction right now uh, that has been interpreted by the DBPR, which basically um, talks about the, uh, the need to limit your reserve contributions from one year to the next so that they don't increase. Um, so if I tell a client that, you know, this year you need to contribute $50,000 to reserves and next year, because costs are going to go up, you should increase that to 52,000 and then 54 and so on. Um, the DBPR has in the last couple of years, let's say, um, s interpreted that as a balloon payment, which is something they specifically prohibit in the statutes. So they tell us, okay, you're not allowed to increase your reserve contributions from one year to the next. And we push back and say, well, if I'm increasing my costs in this community from one year to the next, but you're not allowing me to increase the contributions to reserves, that creates an imbalance. And so what we've been told to do is to remove inflation from the model. Now, I personally strongly disagree with that. Um, in reality, what that means is that we're gonna give a recommendation for one fiscal year. As I said earlier, the reserve study expires in any one year and with a very strong recommendation that next year, we need to add in inflation to find out what costs have done in the prior year and now come up with a new contribution to reserves, which will recognize that increase. Um, so when you're doing a pooled analysis, yes, you can have a long-term projection. Um, we strongly feel that inflation should be part of that projection, but right now we're not including that because of this particular uh, requirement, which hopefully will go away fairly soon as part of the the laundry list of things that are being discussed in Tallahassee over the next year that will hopefully will go away. But um, yeah. bottom line is, again, that's that's a further argument in favor of keeping your reserves up to date on a regular basis because you need to keep uh, track of costs that will be inflating from one year to the next and, and therefore requiring a different contribution rate from one year to the next. Excellent. I have a question here from uh, uh, Helen. I'll take this one. It says, if, if the operating budget falls short, can the board use the reserve money uh, what's required to do that? So the answer is the simple answer is yes, it does take a membership vote to do that. However, I don't believe it's prudent to do something like that. If you're falling short on your operating, then that's if, if you don't have any excess, then you're most likely the best way of handling that is through a special assessment, communicating that to your residents that whatever reason you had a shortfall, if it was for maybe a budget that wasn't uh, properly set up, or maybe you had an unexpected expense, uh, my professional recommendation would be not take it from the reserves um, and <clears throat> really just assess the owners for to in order to fulfill the needs of the association. And I'll take one more, we'll give one more question here. I want to be respectful of your time as well as respectful of those that are here in the class. Uh, let me see here. We have from Robert, he says, we have a condo that has 112 uh, buildings or maybe you meant units, 112 buildings of four villas each. Our reserves have been ignored and not properly funded. We do have around $350,000 in the reserves. What would, what would be a ballpark estimate uh, to complete and cost? Uh, sure. Well, I guess the, the question there, I'm uh, assuming that means what is the cost of doing a reserve study? Reserve, yeah. So um, I'll just give a general answer. I mean, to, to be more specific, you would have to get a, a, a formal proposal. We would need to look at, you know, the location of the property, the amenities, the age. I mean, there's a lot of variables that come into um, how a reserve study is priced out. Um, but in general, uh, the cost is determined based on time, right? How much time will, will we be on site doing the inspection and how much time will be spent researching costs, uh, working with the community, putting the report together, answering questions, you know, all that sort of thing. So um, I would say that on average, if you've never had a reserve study done before, uh, the, the kind of the, the central part of the bell curve is probably between, you know, 3000 maybe $3,500 to 5000 or so for a full reserve study. Now, it can be less than that. It can be more than that, depending on the community. But just as a ballpark idea, yeah, a reserve study is a couple thousand bucks. It's not $50,000, okay? Um, timeline is usually... Uh, probably about six weeks, six to eight weeks, start to finish. Um, right now at budget season uh, with the amount of work we're doing and, and I'm sure other reserve study providers are slammed as well. Um, we're, we're actually now kind of encouraging people to think of this as a project for next year, maybe get an early start doing it next year. Um, 
but it, you know, for anybody out there who wants a more specific number, you know, you can go to our website, which is reservestudy.com. Up in the top right of the page, there's a button that says request a proposal. Uh, if you click that, it will um, lead you to enter your information and we'll get back to you within a couple of days with a formal quote. But that's, you know, a, a reasonable expectation, a couple thousand bucks, you know, a month or two, and uh, you'll have your reserve study. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Will. So thank you so much, Will, for giving us the, your time today. I know uh, you're busy, especially during this time of, time of year. I know we were talking about the amount of uh, studies you're dealing with right now, um, but uh, I appreciate you being here with us. I don't know if you have any closing remarks. No, just other than that, just to say thanks. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, for everybody who's attended today, thank you for spending some of your time with us. Um, the the closing you know, thought I'll, I'll leave everybody with is just living in a community association, especially being on the board of a community association, think of that as being a business partner in a business, right? Yes, you're, you're, you're neighbors with people, maybe you're friends with people, but you guys are all business partners together. And your business, your goal there is to try to promote and grow your property value over time. And one of the ways you do that is by investing in your business, by reinvesting in the, the components, the common areas, the mechanical systems, the amenities. Um, don't think of this as like an apartment situation where you can just pick up the phone, call a landlord or a superintendent who's going to come fix something if it breaks. You are the landlord. You are the superintendent. You are responsible ultimately for what happens there. Um, so if, if we can help you out with that, it's, uh, it's our pleasure. Um, if there's any other questions, if you want contact information, again, our, our website is reservestudy.com. Um, but yeah, otherwise, Raphael, thanks again for the opportunity. It's been great. No problem. Thank you so much for being here. And again, as, uh, as Will said, I would like to say, you know, uh, it, it is very important. You'll realize um, how minimal the cost is for you to really understand what's going on within your community, how much money you should be putting away. And as we said throughout this hour is how important of a communication tool that reserve study is as well. If just sharing that on your association website or e-blast, however, whatever medium you use in your community, you quickly realize that the residents are going to may support you and say, you know what, we need to do what's right for this particular community in order to protect um, our investment and protect them um, for most people's their largest asset. Um, so I appreciate you, Will, again, for being here. I know we work very well together. Um, the product that you guys deliver is stellar. Thank you. Um, so I hope uh, the individuals on this call take the time to give you a call. Um, for those board members and managers that are here today, thank you for taking the time to be on this webinar. Again, it says a lot about your leadership and the commitment that you have to your community. And for those managers, the commitment that you have to your board of directors. So I wanted to applaud you for that. We will be posting the video up on our YouTube page. Uh, so feel free to visit us on YouTube, um, and we'll also be sending a link with the, um, with the direct uh, access to our YouTube page. So make sure to subscribe. We have weekly videos and weekly webinars coming up. Thank you all. Thank you to my team behind the scenes, as well as yours, and making this happen, Will. Appreciate it, and everyone have a great day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.